Welcome again. Happy to have everyone here. This is going to be a, a fairly short webinar that talks about reactive distillation in Promax. We're going to go over a simple system and then show how to set up a distillation in column in Promax that will allow reactions to occur on the specified trays or sections of the column as you desire. It will cover briefly at least one aspect of how to model reactions in Promax. My name is Peter Krauskopf. I've been with Brian Research and Engineering for 12 years almost now and have enjoyed my time here. I've primarily been in charge of support and training. Throughout the webinar, feel free to ask questions. Do so through the chat, though, please. And if possible, send it to everyone. That way I don't have to repeat the questions and everyone can kind of see what I am talking about as we go through. And we'll work from there. So again, this is a webinar on reactive distillation. We're going to be talking about MTBE, or at least the reactive distillation of MTBE. That is, for, so MTBE is methyl tert-butyl ether. It had quite the heyday back in the 80s and 90s as an additive to gasoline. And it has, at least in the US, it has kind of lost its golden status and other things are being substituted in but it's still a fairly widely accepted gasoline additive in other parts of the world. And so there are places that still make it. We'll use it here primarily because it's, it is a very good example of how you can set up and work with a reactive distillation column. So to get started, let's talk a little bit about reactive distillation and how and why you would want to do it. So if you have a reaction here, we have A plus B going to C, the reaction will move forward as long as there's enough A plus B to, or the concentrations of A and B are greater than the concentration of C. At some point, the concentration of C is going to be large enough that the reverse reaction can occur and you will reach what we call equilibrium. The equilibrium state is going to give you your maximum yield, assuming that nothing else in the system changes. So you end up with something over here, this kind of equilibrium setup. And this is what you would get if you just had A and B sitting in a beaker or sitting in a reactor with or without catalyst, and it was allowed to react. It will react up to a certain point. And then if, a, if there is a reverse reaction that is possible, then it will eventually start occurring as well. Now, where that equilibrium sits is all the fun parts of thermo and chemistry. So we want to kind of adjust things so that we can get a better yield. So if we are trying to form C, the best there are a number of ways that we can do that. We can increase the concentrations of A and B. We can decrease the concentration of C. If this is a gas phase reaction, we can increase pressure and that will you want that will cause the reaction to shift towards C. All of these are basic applications of Le Chatelier's principle of a system at equilibrium. In reactive distillation, what we are attempting to do is combine the separation step that we would have to do after we had everything react in our reactor we would eventually get to our best possible equilibrium point or the best possible yield. And then we would want to separate out our, re our product, take our reactants and possibly recycle them to the back, 
or back up to the front. So that would be another step in the process. If we combine that with the reaction, then we can work with Le Chatelier's principle. We separate our product out from our reactants, or it might go the other way. It depends on volatilities at that point, and you may have your reactant at the top and your, or I'm sorry, your product at the top and your reactants at the bottom. In this case, our reactants are at the top and we get our separation. If we put our catalyst and our reaction up here to, to increase our reaction up at the top where we have high concentrations of reactants, we can increase our yield because we now have caused a shift to occur. The product then concentrates down here at the bottom. And so we are able to get a better reaction yield. So that's the general idea of what reactive distillation is for. There are a number of papers and resources out there that discuss the pros and cons of this type of system. It reduce it can reduce your your equipment count. It will possibly increase your yield provided that you're able to do the separation reasonably well, that the separation occurs at temperatures and pressures that are conducive to running the reaction and a few other technicalities for making sure that the process actually works well. For the few that I've seen, that it, when it does work, it works very, very well but it's not something you can do for any and all reactions. So the reactions we're gonna be talking about today are isobutylene plus methanol going to our MT MTBE, the methyl tert butyl ether. The other, uh, other reactions that can occur in the system, and we're gonna talk about the overall system or overall process of the, of MTBE process in a little bit. And if there's any water in the feed, then the water can react with the isobutylene to form tert butyl alcohol. And you can also end up with a dimerization reaction where isobutylene reacts with itself to form diisobutylene. Or if you are a chemist at heart, this is 244 trimethyl 1 pentene. Or if you want to count from the other side, then it's 2244-pentene, or 224-trimethyl-4-pentene, depending on which side of the molecule you feel you want to count from. The process it can be shown, or is shown here. We have our initial feed. The initial feed is typically a set of C4s. You have some butanes, you have some butenes. You are primarily interested in the isobutylene. The other C4s are there primarily because they haven't been separated out yet, but some of them are important in helping make sure that we get the separation of the reactants and products in our distillation column in our the MTBE purification column. So having them there is a good thing. We have our methanol feed and we have a methanol recycle. So this is typically run at an excess of methanol so that this reaction is the primary reaction and these side reactions are not the predominant form. If we have an excess of methanol, the, we can reduce the dimerization reaction by a lot. The water reaction, I believe, is faster than the methanol reaction. And so this one, we just want to make sure we don't have, uh, or we keep the water content in our feed to a bare minimum. One of the benefits of this particular system is that the tert butyl alcohol and the diisobutylene are not necessarily considered bad to be in additives to gasoline. Both increase 
the octane number, both are considered reasonably nice items to have in the gasoline. And so as, as far as the gasoline additive aspects of the MTBE, these two side reactions are not necessarily a bad thing, but we still wanna reduce what, uh, what is occurring. And so in the traditional process, these three streams are mixed. They're brought up to temperature. They're run through a traditional reactor bed. In this reactor bed, all of the water ends up reacting and you end up with a small amount of diisobutylene reacting or being formed. You also end up with about 93% of the MTBE that is going to be formed being formed here in this reactor, or about, I guess about 93% of the isobutylene is going to be reacting to MTBE in this reactor. The heat of reaction then is going to be adjusted through our heat exchanger here. It's brought up to temperature. We now run it through a reactive distillation tower. This unit here is primarily the sole source of our MTBE product. So we try to get it to a reasonable product value. So here we're showing that it's about 99.8% MTBE. The other parts are primarily as shown up here, it's the diisobutylene and the tert butanol and all the other items are pretty much very, very small quantities. So we have a very pure uh, MTBE product. At the top, we are running a reflux and a lot of this is to give us a nice reactive or a nice set of our reactants in this top portion in the rectifying section. In this rectifying section is where the catalyst, the same catalyst that was used in this reactor, that catalyst is placed on trays in, in sections in this top, rectifying section. The concentration of reactants up there is much higher and we are able to convert it or convert up to 99% of the isobutylene into MTBE by, have, by running this with the re reactive distillation rather than just having a reactor followed by separation. So the products up here are primarily your C4s and methanol. We run it through a water wash column water wash column is there to pull out the methanol. So stream 11 is primarily going to be your C4s and any unreacted isobutylene. So this could then be sent off to be further processed or separated or put into different streams. The Water, the methanol is brought down with the water. It then goes through a purification step where the water and methanol are separated. We end up with a reflux or a recycle stream that's about 98% methanol and about 2% water. This is the primary source of water that's entering our reactor but the, you can only get so much out without having major problems with your, with your well, I, I, you run into an issue in trying to purify it too much. The trying to get out more and more water gets harder and harder. So this is the general process. The reactive distillation is what we're going to center on for the rest of our time together. The rest of this process, we can, if you have questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them at this point. But we're not going to talk too much about the rest of this process. If there have been a number of other courses, other webinars that have been done 
for distillation columns. And so this is a distillation column with total reflux. This one is as well. This is just a contactor. And so this contactor is very much like any other contactor that we work with in Promax, whether that be a dehydration column or an amine column or a quench column, things like that. So this isn't difficult. The total Condensers, we'll talk a little bit about how you can set up a total condenser in Promax, and we'll talk about how to set up reactive distillation. In Promax, there are a number of ways of modeling reactions. The most common way, because it is the simplest, is through Gibbs minimization. The idea of Gibbs minimization is to simply allow Promax to readjust atoms between various compounds to minimize the Gibbs free energy of the system. This is quite easy to set up. It's quite efficient from calculation standpoints. By default, it's going to give you the equilibrium output of whatever possible reactions might occur. The drawback of the Gibbs minimization is that it does not pay any attention to activation energies. It does not pay any attention to residence times. It does not pay any attention to reaction pathways. If the Gibbs, Gibbs energy would be minimized by readjusting the atoms in a certain way, then that is exactly what's going to happen. And there's no preference made for fast kinetics versus slow kinetics. It's all assumed that it's going to all happen. And so you get an equilibrium at the end of it all. It's very nice for situations where that is true. When that is not true, then we have to go into molecular reactions. For reactive distillation, you have to use a molecular reaction to, in the column to get the reactive distillation to work. Gibbs minimization will not work in a reactive distillation column. It must be one of these others. These others are called molecular reactions because you define what molecules are reacting to form which molecular products. So we would be, in our case, we would be showing the molecules of isobutylene reacting with the molecules of methanol to form MTBE. The molecular reactions can be broken up into three categories. There's equilibrium, where you set an equilibrium constant. And based on the temperature of the system, the equilibrium constant is calculated. And then given the stoichiometry of the molecular reaction you have set up, the concentrations of those molecules will be calculated. There is the conversion reaction. The conversion reactors or reactions basically dictate how much of a given component is going to react to the products. That can also be temperature dependent, but it's going to follow the stoichiometry of the molecular reaction that you have set up, and it will guarantee that conversion unless you run out of reactants, at which point you will have completely, if there is a limiting reactant and it is consumed before the desired conversion has been reached, you'll get a warning stating such. And then finally, there are what, we're, what we call kinetic reactions in Promax. These reactions have kinetic rate constants. These two don't care about the residence time or size of the reactor. The kinetic reactions do. So this is what you would use to model a plug flow reactor or some kind of continuously stirred reactor. These, or this one is the one that will 
that varying residence time and temperature and items like that will affect the overall yield of the system or of the reaction. This is the one we're going to use for our case, and I'll show you how to set up a kinetic reaction in Promax. The kinetic reactions in Promax work off of a generalized langmuir henschelwood type rate expression. So the rate of reaction is dependent on a forward section where you have a forward rate constant. The concentrations of your reactants in the forward reaction raised to their orders. You there is a reverse reaction that, that can be accounted for. It will have, if it's present, it will have a reaction, a reactive, a, a reaction constant. It will have its reactants for the reverse reaction and their orders. There is also a term down here for adsorption. So if you have a heterogeneous catalyst, you can account for the different adsorption kinetics. There is a constant out front. You will have the adsorption coefficients concentrations to their order, and then you can have a separate order for the entire adsorption term. So when it comes to inputs for this, Promax will need inputs to be able to calculate the forward and reverse reaction constants or, or rate constants. You, you will have to define the orders for the, the components involved in the forward and reverse reactions. You will need to define this constant up front. You will need to define these absorption terms, the order for the various components, as well as this order. So there are a number of inputs that have to go in for a kinetic reaction in Promax. This type of Rate expression, though, can be used for just forward reactions because you can set everything else such that it no longer is that you end up with a value of one. So the K here is zero and that there's no re reverse. So you can have only a forward reaction. You have forward and reverse. You can have forward or reverse plus equilibrium. And what that means is that rather than having an actual rate constant, for the reverse or the forward reaction, you actually have, well, in our case, we're gonna have the forward reaction constant, but we then have an equilibrium constant for the overall, for the total reaction. And so we can use that with the information of the forward reaction rate constant to determine what that reverse reaction rate constant is. And we've already discussed adding and or whether these absorption terms are present or not. If they aren't present, this value is zero. If they are present, this value is non-zero, and you will have the inputs to put in. So to put in the inputs for the reaction rate constants, they are assumed to be of an Arrhenius type. So you will have a pre-exponential term. There is the pre-exponential temperature term. This term is typically zero. This, this order here for the temperature is typically zero. And you have a reaction, the uh, activation energy for the reaction. There is the adsorption constant. It also is of an Arrhenius type expression. You have a pre-exponential and an activation energy. The activation energy for this particular setup, this is the activation energy for adsorption between the component of interest and your heterogeneous catalyst. This is the reaction, the for this is the activation energy for the actual reaction you're following. So the reaction kinetics we've taken from, <clears throat> pardon me, we've taken from this source. The reaction rate has a forward rate constant, an equilibrium constant. We have our reactants in the forward direction. We have our reactant in the 
reverse direction, and we have adsorption terms for the MEOH and for the MTBE. So we're going to, this will work very nicely for our generalized langmuir hinchelwood type expression. We have expressions for the forward rate constant, for the adsorption terms, and for the equilibrium constant. And then there are a few other items over here that we'll talk about as we go through. These are required inputs for getting the reaction expression correct in PROMAX. In working with a PROMAX model, most of the time, everyone automatically, first thing they do is goes to the active environment and sets up the environment. In this case, we have to set up the reaction first. So we're actually gonna start in the project viewer. And here in the project viewer, we're going to come over here to the reaction sets section. We're going to go to all reactions. And here is where we're going to create the reaction that we want to use. We'll then add it to a separate reaction set so that we can add that set then to the environment. The idea behind all that is that each environment can have a set of or a set or several sets of reactions that reactors in that or that are using that environment can apply to the model. You may want to group your reactions so that different reactors only have to worry about certain reactions. You can set it up so that different flow sheets or different environments only worry about certain reactions. This all reactions section lists all of the reactions that are in the project. And so if you have things set up separately, you could come here to see what is in the project as a whole and not just a single reaction set. So to create the reaction, we're gonna come down here and click new. And we get several different areas. We, up here, we get to set our reaction orders and the stoichiometry. Over here, we're gonna be putting in the information for the reaction, depending on what type of reaction it is, whether it's kinetic or equilibrium or conversion and so forth. And then over in this section is where we put in our adsorption terms. So let's start. We've got isobutylene reacting with MeOH and forming MTBE. So the stoichiometry, the coefficients are negative if it is a reactant. So I, we get one isobutylene reacting with one MeOH to form one MTBE. So the stoichiometry is set up this way. Products have a positive coefficient, reactants have a negative coefficient. When this is set up correctly, the reaction equation is shown here and it won't be in red, It'll and it should be a nice balanced equation. The forward and reverse here refer to the forward reaction orders and the reverse reaction orders. So if we look here, you can see that our forward reaction order with respect to MeOH is 1, and our forward reaction order to isobutylene is 0.5. So our forward for isobutylene is 0 0.5. It is 1, and MTBE has no effect on the forward reaction rate, so it has an order of 0. In the reverse, MTBE has an order of 1.5, and there are no other terms. So that would mean that the isobutylene and MeOH have orders of zero. And we 
have 1.5 for the order for MTBE in the reverse direction. The equilibrium is then determined from these inputs. And this sets up our stoichiometry and our orders for our numerator up here. We now need to talk a little bit and provide Promax with some information for our forward reaction rate constant and for this equilibrium constant. We also need to tell Promax what are the units of our reaction rate and a little bit more information so that it can do the necessary conversions. So the equations to use, we don't have a forward and reverse reaction rate. We have a forward reaction rate and an equilibrium constant. So we're going to select forward plus equilibrium. The concentration type. So how are these concentrations measured? There are a number of different ways that the reactions are measured. It could be based off of mole fraction. It could be based off of molarity or activity and fugacity. There's also partial pressures, mass fractions, and mass concentrations. Our, so you'll need to kind of know that from the reaction rate expression itself or from how the reaction rate was determined. You may have to look into the data to figure it out. In our particular case, we know it to be molarity and it is in moles per liter. We can assign a reaction phase. Total means that all of the, all of the reactants, no matter what phase they are in, are going to be allowed to react. And the, all the products, if there is a reverse reaction, all of the reactants in that reverse reaction are going to be allowed to react no matter what phase they are in. That is what total means. You can also have it react only in a specific phase. So we could have it react only in the vapor or only in the light liquid or only in the heavy liquid if there were actually two liquid phases present. In this particular case, we know it to be a liquid phase reaction. And that is the way things are set up with the catalyst and everything. So that's why we will select liquid phase. At this point, anything in the vapor is not going to react. It has to be in the liquid phase to react in either the forward or reverse direction. The kinetic base, this is the component that was used in measuring the rate for our value or for our, our rate expression, that is isobutylene. But in the fact that they are all single or the stoichiometry is one for everything, it doesn't really change much. But that is important in a number of cases. So we're, you'll need to know that. The rate basis. Our rate units are moles per gram catalyst hour. So that is not a moles per volume. That is a moles per mass catalyst. You can see that there is also a moles per total catalyst. And so it depends on how that rate expression was defined in the experiments. And we get units of mole per gram catalyst hour. And so there isn't that specific unit in the drop down list, but you can type it in. In, in the rate units, it wants it in moles per gram times second or kilogram hour. And so trying to get gram hour, there isn't in the drop down list. So we just type it in. Catalyst density, we are told is 360 grams per liter. And so grams per liter. 360 grams per liter is then going to be, allow us to convert between our concentration units and our rate units. Our pre-exponential is 6.2 and our activation energy is a positive 960 
or I'm sorry, 9,600. So 6.12 was our pre-exponential. And we want a positive 9600 as our exponent. In Promax, the negative sign here is assumed. And so if you put in a positive value for the activation energy, that positive value will get a negative put in front and this overall exponent then remains negative. We want the exponent to become positive. So we're going to set this to a negative 9,600. And the other thing I need to point out is that our energy units are in joules per mole. So I need to change this to joules per mole. There is no extra temperature dependence outside of the exponent. And so N is going to remain zero. There is no extra term here. And I guess it's 6.2, sorry. Further down here, there is no, the, the reverse section is grayed out because we don't have a reverse reaction constant. What we do have is the equilibrium constant. Equilibrium constant can, is formed into an expression here. You have coefficients for a constant, a one over T term, an ln T term, a first order temperature, and then this E is for a second order temperature, so a T squared term. Our expression is here, so we have a constant and a one over T term. So we will put those values in, 16.33, and then 6818. C, D, and E are zero because we don't have any of those other terms. The approach temperature, we're going to leave at zero for now, but what the approach temperature is, is allows you to change the temperature that this equilibrium constant is calculated at compared to the system temperature at that point in the system. There are conversion parameters down here. We're not going to enter anything in here because there is we aren't doing any kind of conversion reaction. And so that takes care of this numerator term in our rate expression. We're now going to discuss this bottom term. And so we're going to start adding those over here. So for our MEOH term, our pre-exponential is here, and we have, again, positive values for our energy terms. So needs to be 0.1 e to the minus 13. Our energy units are joules per mole. This is going to be a negative 97500. Again, that's because the negative in this expression is inherent in the program. And we want to have a positive exponent, not a negative exponent. So we add it as a negative value here to give us a total of a positive. 1.6 times 10 to the minus 16. So that one. This one has one, one, two, three. All right. So we now need to set up our orders. So the first one is our MEOH, and so it has a first order in MEOH and a zeroth order in all the others. And then our, our last one is a first order in MTBE and a zeroth order in everything else. So, isobut so we'll come over here. Our first one, isobutylene, is a zeroth order. MEOH was first order, and MTBE is zeroth order. And then 
zero, zero, and one, or our second one. And so this sets up our reaction. We now have input our molecular reaction. We have molecules of isobutylene reacting with molecules of AminoH to form molecules of MTBE. This can go in either direction. All right, so we now need to create a reaction set so that we can add whatever reactions we want to have into our environment. So to create the reaction set, you right click on reaction sets and you click add. gives us a reaction set. Here we can, it's very similar to a user value set for those of you who have used user value sets before. Here we can call this our MTBE reaction. We are going to add a reaction to it, or we could create a new one that hasn't already been put into the project. And we're going to add from the ones that are already in the project. So that brings in our MTBE. This reaction set can be set up to work with specific reactor types. By default, it's set up to kinetic. If you don't want to do kinetic, you'll have to select one of the other ones. And then you can deselect kinetic, and then it will only be available for equilibrium reactor reactors so on and so forth. We're gonna leave this as only kinetic, and we're gonna make this, oh, I missed my catalyst density. Reactions. That's right, this is 360 grams per liter. So as you saw, if you don't have all of your data present, it's not gonna let you activate the reaction. So everything has to be available. And once it's all available, you can click active. The reaction needs to be active in the reaction set that you want to have. Otherwise it won't be applied in the reactors that you say you to use that reaction set in. So that has created our reaction set. We're now ready to set up our environment. So we'll come here to our active environment. This is a fairly straightforward chemical section. It does have MEOH in it. So we're going to go with Peng Robinson Polar. You could also use SRK Polar if you wish. We're going to give our components here. See if I can, it's not gonna go any smaller. So I think I can do it this way. We want NC4 and then IC4 on butene, cis2 butene. And this 244 trimethyl one pentene is the same as diisobutylene. So I'm going to put it in as diiso. Actually, diisobutylene doesn't show up in the list. So that's why we're going to use the 244. I just remembered that. Trimethyl one pentene. And so that sets up our components. need to add our reaction set to this environment. So to add the reaction set, you come to the reaction sets tab. And this is going to list all of the reaction sets that are available in the project. There's only one 
but we need to make it a selected reaction set so that this environment will allow this, whatever reactions are in this set to occur within its environment, whatever flow sheets are using this environment. We'll click OK. That sets up our environment. Now we can set up our drawing. Since we're only working with the reactive distillation column, it's only going to be a total condenser column. our missing streams. This is our liquid overhead product, and this is our liquid bottoms product. We'll go ahead and set up our column. So our column has 45 trays in it. So we'll, we're gonna do this as a mass and heat transfer column. You can do it as an ideal stage as well, if you wish. Either one of these can be modeled or either model, either of the distillation models can be used with reactive distillation. We'll go with the mass and heat transfer. We are told that there is a 10 PSI drop and that the top is operating at 75 PSI G. Our feed tray is tray 25, so we need to make it visible. So we'll show the stage. We'll, that's so that we can connect to it, connect our feed to that tray when it's all done. To set up the reactions, we want to have the reaction, we're basically going to set each of the trays of five through 18 to have catalyst on them or it, within that, that section of the column, there's gonna be catalyst available for reaction. And so to do that, we come here to the user reactions property of the distillation column. Here we can define what reaction set of all the sets that are in the environment, you would get all of those in the drop-down list here and you can select which reaction set you wanna work with. We can then set which trays are the trays that are going to allow reactions. And so we're told it's eight through, or I'm sorry, five through 18. If there were multiple reactions within this reaction set, you could decide which reaction you wanted because you would have multiple columns one for each reaction. And so you could say that there, this is a reactive tray, but this reaction isn't going to occur because there would be other reactions that would. And so it would then allow you to select what you want to have happening at each point in the column. Because this is a mass and heat transfer column, also, well, and even if it were an ideal stage, you would still have to provide column information so that Promax can determine residence time. Because this is a kinetic reaction, you, the residence time is important for determining the extent of reaction. And so we need to provide information about the size of the column. In this case, we're told it's an 11 foot diameter. We're going to go with a 0 0.9 system factor. We're given tray spacing and weir height information that is found here on the tray hardware. We get two feet of spacing and a two inch weir. We'll leave all the other defaults. We're going to use the boil up and the reflux ratios. 2.2 and 2.3. Now, because this is a total condenser on the column, this condenser does not actually act as an extra stage of separation. So setting the temperature in here does not uh, take up a degree of freedom in the column. 
we can set the temperature inside or here in the specifications and for a total condenser this is where i would recommend you set the temperature for the system we'll click add and the type of specification we want to add is a phase property temperature is a phase property so we're going to select phase property this is my condenser temperature Stage I want to set the temperature on is the condenser. The phase is total. The property is going to be temperature. The reflux condition, our temperature is actually a subcooled temperature, meaning that it's no longer going to be. It's not just cooled to a bubble point liquid. It is actually cooled below that temperature. That temperature is 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is a specification. Now it does look like our column is over specified because there were only two degrees of freedom to begin with. But again, this condenser temperature does not change or it is, does not take away one of the degrees of freedom. The reflux ratio is used to determine how much of the liquid is returned to the column versus how much goes off as product. The boil up ratio determines how much vapor is produced versus how much liquid is removed. Those two take up degrees of freedom. The actual temperature in the, in the total condenser does not change does not change the split or anything I mean, here, but it will affect what the total energy requirement is. I'm going to add one further specification here. It's going to be another temperature, and this is going to be the temperature of our reboiler. The reason I'm going to add this in is it will increase the speed with which the column solves the first time. So rather than sitting here waiting for the column to solve and be bored with that, I figured we would try to speed things up a little bit. If you don't have this estimate, this estimate is used the first time the column solves to help set the, the, the ranges of things. If you don't have it, Promax does an internal check on things and comes up with a guess. This is just giving Promax a better guess to start from is what it comes down to. So that sets up our column. This is a heat exchanger and in Promax, heat exchangers require pressure drop. Condenser temperature specification is to get is to decide what the duty is in the condenser. So determine to determine what Q1 is, we're going to set that subcooled temperature. And that is all that it is doing is determining this duty for us. The reflux ratio is determining what the split is between our product and what is returned to the column. Temperature that we set down here is simply used in the first time this column solves, it's going to pick a temperature for down here and then try to solve. The algorithms in Promax are pretty good most of the time at picking a starting temperature. I'm just giving it a better estimate of where to start. And so that's why this one is listed as an estimate as these others are listed as specifications. All right, so now we have to set up our feed stream. Our feed coming in at 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Do 
115 pounds. We have 400 gallons per minute. And we'll put our composition in here. Mole fractions. All right. So we have everything set up here. And we should now be able to execute our project. I'm going to chug through here a little bit. I do wrong. Oh, <laughs> there's what I missed. I need to turn on my adsorption code, my adsorption terms. They are currently not active. And so there is no adsorption in the bottom. And so I need, I can turn those on here. You'll notice that they get a blue background. And that's because they aren't that changes that are specific to this block. The, one of the nice things with the reactors in Promax is you can bring in a reaction set and then you can make specific changes that are going to affect that reaction only in the block that's using the reaction. And so that's a good thing, but it also, because it is quite powerful, it also means that you can mess things up because not everything, you, you, you'll think it's the same reaction everywhere, only to find out that it's not if you don't aren't careful. So let me do this now, and it's going, it should work much better now. It's still not wanting to. What am I doing wrong? Order constant. Well, let me... Rather than waiting in through all of the troubleshooting, let's bring up this one. This one should be the exact same system already solved. And I don't know what I've done wrong, but I probably have an input somewhere, missed a sign or something odd. We have our expressions here, our user reaction. I guess we're in five to 18. Reaction set, we have our reaction here with our kinetic expression and our absorption coefficients are turned on. That's all the same. When it's solved, it will give you an extent of reaction. And so this is the amount of uh, isobutylene that has been consumed at each tray a total amount of isobutylene that has been consumed down here. And so we can now come in, we can look at, and you can see the concentrations of your reactants here, and you can see the purity of your product down here in this one. So we can set up and do a call out our compositions. We want then I will let you all go. Thank you all very much for your time today. I do appreciate you taking the time to learn a little bit more about Promax and what it does and how it can work to model new and interesting systems for you. So this was for reactive distillations. And if you have questions on how to set up a reaction or how you would, if you have questions on uh, how to add a reaction to your distillation column, then feel free to give us a, a call or contact us at support at BRE.com.